Welcome back, boils and ghouls. Now, while Frank Rosetta is one of the most widely known names in the entertainment, the graphic design, and the fine arts communities, he's probably best beloved and most admired by his comic book fans. But for all of the love and admiration that's heaped on his name, Frank Frazetta only ever truly produced one single comic book from cover to cover. But why? What exactly happened with editor Ray Crank? Why would Frank Frazetta go from being one of the fastest rising stars in the field to suddenly and desperately trying to get out of the medium completely? The answer is one of the greatest stories never told. It's the story of Frank Frazetta's single comic opus that ended almost before it began. This is the story of Thunder, King of the Congo. extremely personal guy and he didn't do too many interviews. He just didn't talk about stuff much. And when I used to see interviews with him, he came off as basically just this kind of badass, gives no fucks kind of guy. I wish I could quote him more like interviews and stuff here, but he just didn't do that many. They're so rare that it's now believed that probably the most famous and now most infamous of all Frazetta interviews is completely fake and it was done to sell an unlicensed bootleg book of his works but that's a story for a completely other day and it's one i'll gladly tell you guys if you want to know about it just get in the comment section below and let me know through these sparse interviews though and especially interviews with family friends and colleagues the more you find out he was very emotional i don't mean that frank frazetta had a bad temper or anything like that Apparently, he was very sensitive about his work. He was always a very serious individual when it came to his work, and a lot of his big life decisions were apparently visceral gut reactions because he's got his feelings hurt where things didn't go the way that he thought they should when it came to his art. And when Frazetta made a decision, boy, did he stick to it. There was no going back from burning that bridge. So while he was encouraged by even his art teachers from a young age to be a fine artist, Frank Frazetta had absolutely no interest in this. Young Frazetta was only interested in two things, girls and comic books. Unless you want to count like street brawling and baseball, but we've talked about that in previous episodes. If you want to learn about that, just go back and check those out. Nowadays, people associate Frank Frazetta basically only with his fine art fantasy work. But when he first broke into the comic industry, Frazetta was well known and very highly lauded for his funny anthropomorphic animal illustrations. One notoriously violent cover from this period actually led to his eventual work for EC Comics. Again, if you want to know about it, get in the comment section and let me know. Anyway, Frazetta was always interested not only the medium of comics and the storytelling and artistic possibilities that allowed from a young age, but he was very, very interested in something most people these days don't even associate with comic books anymore. Strips. During Frazetta's youth, the notoriety and money that came from comic strips was unimaginable and basically unattainable to most other artists, especially graphic artists, anyone outside of the fine art industry. Big syndicated strips ran cross country, making their creators not only good money, but turning them into household names during a time when credits on comic books were so sparse and frowned upon that we're still trying to figure out who worked on what, even with comic book legends like Jack Kirby and Frank Frazetta. So for Frank Frazetta, comic books were interesting, but they didn't seem to have any kind of viable future. Comic strips, on the other hand, represented a way out. But then things changed. There was suddenly a new face on the block, and it seemed like everyone was talking about this newest sensation to invade the newsstand. One that would also make his creators household names and earn them highly publicized checks from their publishers at the time. Superman wasn't just a new face for the companies that would become DC Comics. He changed the entire 
industry. With his explosion in popularity, Superman became the first merchandised and cross-licensed comic book character. Suddenly there was money everywhere. They just couldn't make enough Superman shit to sell to people and Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster became widely discussed figures among the comic book industry. How much they earned, how they achieved what they did, how they could be emulated, and how they could be plagiarized or in some cases just outright copied. Check out my Captain Marvel episode. So with this monetary revolution in the comics field, a new door opened for Frank Frazetta who believed he could now explore the genre of comics that he loved so much while still earning a name for himself and good money while he was at it. Now Frank Frazetta began doing work with some of the greats of the field as young as 14 by some accounts. Um, according to him it was 16 but some other people have indicated 14. Now, a guy named John Junta was the first person to take a chance on Frazetta, and in 1944, Junta would end up inking a story entitled Snowman, starring the titular character, created and penciled by Frank Frazetta himself for Tally Ho Comics. Frazetta credits Ghoulish Graham Ingalls as the first person to really take notice of his talents in the comics field, though. After Frank Frazetta was let go from his then position, Ingalls helped Frank get a job at Standard Comics, also sometimes known as Nader and Quality Comics, and this was in 1948, and Frank Frazetta quickly began to earn a name for himself. Now, despite the fact that none of these characters that he worked on were breakout hits, Frazetta not only became more and more in demand, but he started to actually earn a name and fans. Publishers would get letters from people who sought his name out, his signature on stuff, and they wanted more material. They wanted more stuff from this guy. So by 1951, only a few years in, Frazetta was poised to take the comic book industry by storm. He was young, charismatic, he had an insane work ethic, he was extremely talented, and he knew it. The stars were aligning for Frazetta, but there was one thing that would ultimately prove to be a chink in the building block of Frank Frazetta's armor and his demise in the comic book field. Frank Frazetta wouldn't give up his original artwork. Now, I've talked about this multiple times, and at this point, basically, everyone knows just how rare comic book artwork from the Golden Age is. And this isn't just because it's art and it was on paper and some of it got destroyed over 80 years. No, this was a time when commercial art was essentially created for use in the production of whatever it was meant for, and then it was either just outright destroyed or tossed into these legendarily horrible piles and left to rot and deteriorate in some forgotten corner or corridor. The Superman cover that you see here, it's the only sole existing one from that golden age of comics. I saved it from destruction, actually. So it was common practice to destroy the, destroy the artwork? It was. It was routine. Once the cover went from our offices, the engraver would shoot it and destroy the original because it wasn't thought of anything more than for reproduction. And I saved them because I just hated to see anything that beautifully drawn. Being an artist, I immediately called the engraver and said, don't destroy that cover, send it back. At the time, I think I was the only one. Fortunately, I was there at the right time. Now, there were some other people who realized just how amazing this work was, like Jerry Robinson, but Robinson was never as rabid about keeping his originals as Frazetta was. It almost seems like parting with a piece actually hurt Frank Frazetta somehow. It's also worth noting that by the 1950s, Guys like Bob Kane were starting to really cash in on having a name, and they were selling original art to fans and collectors, and this meant that publishers who, even say five years prior, had just thrown this stuff away, began developing a really nasty habit of never returning original art, greedily seizing basically everything they could for later resale. For most artists in the illustrative field, this was just a fact that you had to deal with. It was a downside to the industry, but it was an undeniable part of it. 
but not to Frazetta. No, Frazetta was always a shrewd man. He knew how good he was, and he was not giving up his art without a fight. By 1950, Frazetta had begun to rile feathers across the industry by demanding his original art back, and he really avoided working with people who weren't cooperative with that. So when he started working with magazine enterprises in the 1950s, it was most likely with the understanding that not only would he retain his original art, he would have a little bit more artistic freedom. Now, in the past, he had worked for reduced sums in exchange for keeping the original art. And while I can't say that for sure that this is the case with magazine enterprises, there's a number of reasons I believe that this is the case. What I can say for sure is that Frazetta had done a lot of covers for them, but that magazine enterprises wanted Frazetta to do an entire book. Frazetta had never done this. Frazetta had developed enough of a name by that point, he finagled keeping the original art, but magazine enterprises, and I think specifically Vin Sullivan, was not happy about it. And magazine enterprises begrudgingly agreed, given his growing stature, to allow Frazetta to keep his original artwork. But this was basically only as part of a package deal. In exchange for Frazetta keeping the original art, he would get a reduced page rate and Sullivan would get the solo book that he wanted out of Frazetta. When news of what he was going to be working on came down the pipe though, Frazetta could not have been less enthused. After a series of covers for Western titles like Tim Holt and Ghost Rider, Frazetta produced what should have been his breakout book, Thunder, King of the Congo. Instead, however, Thunder would prove to be the only comic book that Frank Frazetta would ever fully illustrate from cover to cover. Now, Frank Frazetta was given a rough idea of what magazine Enterprise wanted, which was essentially a Tarzan knockoff, and sent along on his merry way with little other direction. Frazetta was not thrilled with the subject matter, but fortunately, he was familiar enough with the subject matter that he thought that he could put his own personal spin on it. Frazetta took the Tarzan-esque generic jungle adventure idea of a man just lost in the jungle and basically flipped it on its head. It's not groundbreaking, but I did always think that the idea for the original Thunder was awesome in that first issue. I mean, at least the first three stories in that issue, because this is where we get to the really nasty part of this whole situation. See, Frazetta did three complete stories for the first issue of Thunder under this basic premise. There was this World War II Air Force officer, Roger Drum, and his plane gets shot down over these crazy African jungles and it crashes. And when he wakes up, he doesn't remember who he is and he's immediately attacked by dinosaurs and these weird ass Neanderthal ape men. He kills the dinosaurs and he escapes the ape men, but he still has no idea who he is. What we learn as he fights all this crazy shit, though, is that he's basically like if Jason Bourne had a kid with Liam Neeson's character from Taken and Chuck Norris raised that little bastard. Because, like, Roger Drum is 100% certified badass. Now, eventually in the fourth story of the first issue, he finds out who he is and decides on returning to living in the jungle where he knows what's actually trying to kill him and why, and he falls in love with this jungle princess and a whole bunch of other really just Tarzan rip-off plot fodder BS. The, the first three tales, riddled with horrible offensive racial stereotypes as they may be, are Frazetta at top form, delivering some of the most impressive work for the comics field ever, in my opinion. The line work and dynamism he conveys on the page is astoundingly gorgeous to look at. He seemed as close to passionate about the subject matter as he could be. I mean, Frank Frazetta had essentially come up with this character after all, and I feel like he might have planned on staying with this title for a little while. But a series of calamitous events would culminate in a nasty clash with editorial over the contents of Thunder, which would forever change Frasetta's life. 
When the issue was nearing completion, Frazetta turned in the third story and went to start on the fourth. Now, I believe he was modestly but understandably proud of Thunder. As unoriginal as Thunder might have been, and despite having been published in 1954, and despite the racial stereotyping, it's visually still one of the most impressive comic books I have ever read, and I've read a lot of books. In fact, it's been reprinted several times legitimately over the years if you want to read it, once by Russ Cochran from the black and white art that Frazetta managed to retain, and then later in a recolored format hardcover from Dark Horse a few years ago, which I'm sure is much more affordable. When Frazetta was turning in the work, Magazine Enterprises must have known how good the book was, but Vin Sullivan was the original editor for Superman, and he was an old DC whipcracker that had basically been pushed out of the fold before the money started flowing. And it's my personal opinion, he probably had a real ax to grind with Frazetta, either over the wages he was demanding, and or the retention of the original artwork. But Frazetta also knew he was talented and he was making a name for himself. So he might have said something out of pocket or something that rubbed Sullivan the wrong way. I don't know. I do know that I have never read a single other bad word about Ray Crank, who Frank Frazetta claims edited the series and demanded the story changes, most other sources indicate that Crank was peripherally involved at best, and definitely was not the editor. Furthermore, if demands were made of Frazetta on Thunder, Ray Crank was simply speaking for Vin Sullivan, who would be the one demanding these changes, and with whom he'd been extremely close with and been working with for a number of years at this point. It's not impossible, but I find it highly unlikely that events transpired exactly how Frank Frazetta claims. Whatever the case may be, Magazine Enterprises knew the book was too good to cancel, but they were used to complete control over their writers and artists, and this was not the generic Tarzan Jungle adventure book that they had in mind. There were giant snake demons and dinosaurs all over the place for fuck's sake. So someone, probably Vin Sullivan, but maybe Ray Crank, told Frazetta to take it out. All of it. Essentially, every element of the story that Frazetta had come up with on his own was systematically picked out and excised for the fourth and final story in issue one of Thunder, as well as the stories for the proposed second issue. Frazetta was either absolutely furious or completely crestfallen. I honestly don't know which. All of the originality that he had poured into this character was being cut out bit by bit. But again, I want to mention, I don't know if Ray Crank is actually the guy to lay the blame on here. There's little to no information on Crank himself, but I read enough stuff about him while doing research for Ghost Rider by Dick Ayers and by several other guys who were members of the Magazine Enterprises crew and worked under him as editor and writer, and nothing points to him being this controlling or manipulative. I know this much for sure. Lining Vin Sullivan's pockets is the actual real reason that Magazine Enterprises demanded that Thunder be changed in the first place. No one had any motives for this sudden and radical revision three stories deep into what could have been a very successful and lucrative book for everyone involved. No one but Vin Sullivan, who had sold the movie rights right out from under everyone. There was already a serialized Thunder King of the Congo adaptation in the works. And this version of Roger Drum did not fit any part of the persona that Sullivan and Magazine Enterprises wanted for their Tarzan-esque serials, which ironically were set to star none other than Buster Crab of all people. Now, for anyone who isn't a complete film nerd or whatever, the fact that this all happened over a Buster Crab Tarzan ripoff serial 
is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Buster Crab didn't just get famous for playing Tarzan or anything back in the 30s. He did do that, but he built a career on playing Tarzan ripoffs, but Crab wouldn't give up acting. He kept finding Tarzan shit for the next 30 years, and the very last of which would prove to be Thunder, King of the Congo. Now, around this period, in the earlier part of the 50s, he still had enough draw that, like a lot of other personalities of the day, he had a comic book, and yes, you guessed it, Frazetta actually had to draw Buster Crab comics. He did covers with longtime partner in crime, Al Williamson, for two issues of the Buster Crab series that was running just prior to the release of Thunder in 52 and 53. Frazetta would often help out or take some of the delegated part of Williamson's projects when he was behind schedule or Williamson thought that Frank Frazetta needed some money to pay for food. The work Frazetta did with Williamson is among some of the best he ever produced in many cases, and I think much of that owes to the two men's relationship. So when I was younger, I was always puzzled with his covers for the Buster Crab issues. If you look, Frazetta seems to almost struggle with Crab's likeness, and Frazetta never struggled with likenesses. He built one of the most lucrative and popular sections of his entire career on portraiture and characters. It confused me to no end when I was younger. But now, looking back at them, I can't help but wonder what had already transpired. How much did Frazetta know about the Thunder adaptation sale at this time? And if he might have not just been basically completely enraged having to work on this stuff, but needing the money so badly, he couldn't turn down the work. Now, with Frazetta and essentially every other person in this entire story being dead and not many interviews to go from, I don't know if we're ever going to know the full truth of what actually happened and how it all went down. And honestly, it doesn't really matter. Any way that things went, with Buster Crabbe set to play the role of Roger Drum, Magazine Enterprises wanted the character more in line with the Tarzan ripoff that they originally had in mind, not this weird, esoteric comic full of dinosaurs and giant snakes that Frazetta was pushing. So instead of fighting about it or trying to do anything really, Frazetta simply finished revising the fourth story that he was given and quietly walked away from the only book that he would ever illustrate in its entirety. One of the most highly respected and unarguably one of the most talented people to ever grace the comic book medium, Frank Frazetta was driven out by the editorially driven story demands on the behest of Hollywood films. And this was the 50s. By 1955, Frank Rosetta would begin working as the ghost artist on Al Cap's Little Abner, where he would stay for the better part of a decade until wage cuts forced him to move on. So judging by this and the Buster Crab covers, I think Frazetta was painfully aware of the situation well before the publication of Thunder Issue 1, perhaps even as early as the demanded story revisions from editorial. Now, while Frazetta never officially left the comic book industry, after Thunder, he never really made a very big effort to do much with it ever again. There was a very brief moment right after this where if the stars had aligned correctly, Frank Frazetta would have worked exclusively with EC Comics through connections with longtime friends Graham Ingalls and Al Williamson. Frazetta did do a good bit of work for EC, and he even said that Gaines seemed like a fairly okay guy, which is about the kindest thing I ever heard him say about any publisher of any of his stuff. So why didn't Frazetta go on staff at EC? Why did he only provide a small sampling of these absolutely killer masterworks for the EC titles? Well, if you watched the last episode about the EC Comics Real Life Vault of Horror, you might actually have guessed the answer to this question already. 
Gaines basically insisted on keeping the original artwork for all of the EC stories. And by basically, I mean that Frank Frazetta ended up taking a 50% pay cut. I believe the rate was $60 per page and he ended up getting $30 per page for keeping his original art. From what I've read, Frazetta never actually got angry about this, but it meant that because he wouldn't part with his stuff, that the pay from EC Comics made sole employment there totally untenable. Embittered and angry, perhaps emotionally wounded more than we would think as well, Frank Frazetta found himself in what would become the darkest, most trying and difficult period in his entire career. Now, a small, seemingly insignificant portrait that would show up in EC's Mad would change all of that overnight, but that's another story for another day, kiddies, and if you want to hear that one, you'll have to get in the comments section below and let me know. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed tonight's bone-chilling tale and maybe even learned something. If not, tune in tomorrow. Totally different fact about a totally different thing. If you did enjoy, though, do me a favor, hit that like button. If you really enjoyed what you saw, Hulk smash that subscribe button. If you do that, make sure you ding the little notification bell to keep up with these doses of trivia that I'm always dropping. And again, thank you so much for sticking with me. I hope you enjoyed, made me learn something. And as always, I really truly and honestly ask only two things. Keep hitting those local shops and keep reading comics. <laughs>